Hi everyone, my name is Hannah Brady. I'm a colonist for the Daily Cal. I write religiously inclined and today I'm here talking with the author of a newly released book called The Intolerance of Tolerance, Dr. Don Carson. Thank you so much for coming in today. It's a real pleasure to have you here. My privilege. I was wondering if you could just give us a brief summary of the book. Partly I'm concerned to show that the nature of tolerance has changed in history and what we now call tolerance is not what would have been recognized as tolerance 50 years ago, let alone 500 years ago. Okay. And this new tolerance has become an ultimate virtue in the society. Uh, in the past, um, people have had systems of thought, whether Marxist or Christian or Muslim or whatever, and then tolerance is sort of parasitic on that. Uh, it's how much you can let people get away from the dominant moral, religious, ideological values of the society. But Today, tolerance, the new tolerance, has become independent of all uh, structures of thought so that it becomes the new god, it becomes the new ultimate good. The old tolerance said, in effect, in words often ascribed to Voltaire, although he never actually said them, I may detest what you are saying, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. So that meant it was possible for me to disagree with you and you to disagree with me, but we would still be judged ultimately tolerant if we both defended the other's right to articulate his or her views. Okay. But in the new tolerance, you're not supposed to say, you're not even supposed to think that somebody else is wrong in various domains. That's already casting you as a superior person, that's arrogance, that's intolerance, and thus the demonstration of real tolerance is refusing to say that other people are wrong. So are you proposing more of a return to old tolerance? I do think that if we return to more of the old tolerance, then what we want to see is more willingness to enter into robust theological and ideological and, and uh, conceptual moral discussion on many, 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 many issues and, and engage, but to do so civilly. I would say that even if we can't uh, establish an ultimate good that everybody agrees on, it's important to maintain the categories of good and evil. Um, because uh, if instead you opt for some kind of moral relativism where you're not allowed to speak of ultimate evil or, of, or, or the like, then it's hard to be outraged over things that you should be outraged over. And, and at the end of the day, you have no place for moral outrage. I, I think that's sad. Since we're denouncing moral relativism now, or we, you are in your book, um, how, how do you establish these categories? There's a difference between saying that it is difficult to establish a moral position for adherents of a particular religion to, to, to agree to. And it's another thing to say there are no moral positions. Um, if, if, you, if you claim the second, then you give up trying. And then the or only moral position is not to take a moral position, which itself becomes, again, a position, a position that is <laughs> remarkably uh, inconsistent and, and, and defeatist. It, it's, uh, it's, it's horrible. So my final question is going to touch on how do we go about dealing with this issue when it comes to implementing policy and laws because although I agree that it's important to keep dialogue open in society and to be able to oppose vehemently, obviously without any violence, any of those kinds of things, but to be able to oppose beliefs on a very fundamental basis and not to have to accept other people's beliefs. But there comes a certain point in time when laws do need to be made and people are impelled by those laws to act one way or another on a lot of moral issues. So in the modern context, there's a lot of conversation about gay marriage, abortion, both of which the Christian church has very decisive opinions on. And so how do you go from conversation to law without infringing upon other people's moral beliefs? There is a rising voice, especially on the left, though sometimes on the right, that thinks that the only way that religion can be free from the state is to be private. So if you're meeting to have corporate worship or whatever, 
and whatever you say and do has no bearing whatsoever on how anybody lives, then that's okay. You can have freedom of religion. But if you think that there's something in your religion that has a moral bearing on something, mm -hmm. and that that moral bearing properly enacted in law is good for the culture, it's good for the society, it's good for the state, then Christians want to speak out on it. Now, those on the opposite side say, no, the only neutral stance is the secular stance. And that's what I oppose. That is, the secular stance is not itself neutral. The secular stance is itself already a position. I think that we have to face the fact that whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or a secularist or a Jew, uh, whether you're an agnostic, I don't care what you are, you have the right to speak into a democratic culture as to how life should be lived. And within that framework, that includes the passing of laws. And in any democracy, whenever there's a passing, some passing of laws, some like them and some don't. Some win and some don't. And you try to pass laws in such a way that those who uh, don't win uh, have maximal freedoms. So it seems to me that every citizen ought to have the right to speak and try to influence public policy. And of course they're speaking out of a frame of reference. But so is the secular speaking out of a frame of reference. In that sense, that's a faith position as much as a Christian or a Muslim position.